This is the uh, one of the priority areas. This is sort of part of the phase one and phase two area of the, of the beginning of evaluations for mitigating the, uh, particularly the nitrogen impacts. These ponds have got uh, been evaluated by the Massachusetts Estuary Project, and they are uh, have been studied and, and with, with with evaluations done to set the nitrogen loading limits, the total maximum daily loads that can uh, should be entering the ponds. But in Falmouth, actually. The issues are focused on the estuaries, but as we all know, who live here in town, beaches are closed every summer due to coliform bacteria. These are open waters. These are not estuaries. So actually, the Buzzards Bay, the Vineyard Sound are impacted already by, by nitrogen flowing out through the groundwater into those areas. The, uh, the sources of nitrogen, is, it, it's been touched on uh, quite a bit today, but this is a uh, 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 shows that the main contributions to the estuary environment. You've got stormwater, septic systems, fertilizer, atmosphere in the form of, of, of rain uh, from, from nitrogen in the atmosphere, as well as benthic flux, which is basically decomposing sediment that contributes the, uh, the nitrogen to the waters. Now, no two estuaries are alike. I don't know any sense in going into details here, but this basically breaks down all of the different sources of nitrogen entering the estuaries in, 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 this, in this pie chart form. And you can see that by colors, they're different. And so you have different ponds are affected differently. And so that's what we need to do is to look at the, at the estuaries and understand them and, and deal with the nitrogen. But what I'll be talking about is looking at basically the total, the total loads. And this sort of shows that the, that the, uh, the TMDL, the total maximum daily load targets, and then it shows basically the change at the current levels of what's going into the ponds from all sources, not just from watershed, which is emphasized in the MEP reports, but from all sources. Now, how do we deal with that to knock down the nitrogen uh, by, by these percentages uh, in this process? Now, what it means then is that each pond, if in evaluating on an annual basis, this much nitrogen, tons of nitrogen, need to be either stopped from flowing in or removed from, in, from within the uh, within the estuaries. And, the, um, and one other important dimension to this that makes it very interesting and it's very, in, uh, very innovative is that sentinel thresholds, which is really what determines the total maximum daily load have been set for these estuaries. And that sentinel threshold is the healthy concentration of nitrogen for natural productivity, for uh, uh, eelgrass, clams, fish, whatever, you need a certain concentration. Nitrogen is a good thing, and it, it's important for production, as we all know. And as has been discussed today, wastewater is a misnomer. But anyway, these need to be knocked down from the levels at the bottom. And so how do you do that? And again, we're looking at this now from the standpoint of, so let's say, let's look at a systems approach, but let's start with the cheapest option. See how far you can go with that and then move up in, in cost a move upstream, in effect, uh, in terms of cost, and, and try and keep it to, to the minimum. In fact, to actually be able to make money out of wastewater here in Falmouth. So why is too much nitrogen a bad thing? And basically, you end up getting the nitrogen flowing in, you get phytoplankton growing, bacteria, and you end up getting shading. That causes the eel grasses to die the, underneath it. The, the, uh, it, it, fall, it, it falls. To the, to the bottom, it decomposes and starts releasing noxious uh, chemicals. They're, they're also quite, quite foul smelling, which is not too great for a uh, tourist area. So in looking at, again, to look at the, uh, for any area, let alone tourist area, but, <laughs> but to look at the um, an approach, we can look at an integrated strategy of looking at sort of three areas. And one is sort of looking at estuary management, which has two components, inlet widening and shellfish aquaculture. In this case, we're dealing directly with the problem. The problem is water quality in the estuaries. That's what we're after. That's what we're trying to remediate. And then you can move upstream, and you've got all these other factors that come in. The runoff, fertilizer controls, eco, you know, eco toilets are options, uh, denitrifying uh, household septic components, pruinal reactive barriers, sewers, there's a lot of things. But the critical thing that's been discussed quite well today is the community outreach and education. And that's very important, get people engaged, get more information, get more knowledge, 
And at the same time, you get um, uh, uh, actually it improves, it, it, it contributed significantly to coming up with, with an effective design as well as getting people uh, fully engaged. Now, can oyster farming help manage nitrogen pollution? By the way, oyster farming has been mentioned. It's a, is a, a practice that's been going on on Cape Cod. This is just a, a, a site in, in Osterville that shows where, where, where oyster farms are. And as you can see, the placement is critical here, because at least the, the acknowledgement of the placement, because they're placed, and now there's still navigational channels or recreational areas. There are various uh, aspects to, to allowing uh, a, a complementary use of the resource. And so you have to start thinking in that context as well. Now, working toward a paradigm shift really means thinking about wastewater as a resource. And there may be an immediate way to do that. And not only can, uh, can you grow uh, shellfish uh, with the nitrogen in the water by consuming phytoplankton, but it also it helps to clean the water quickly. All the other upstream systems, you've got loads in the groundwater, and all that has to seep out and get into the it gets to be cleared out, and that takes years in addition to the time of doing the intervention. So by going right into the estuaries, you can do it in a, uh, it, it can happen much quicker because you're right into the problem. Now here we have uh, floating cages. This is a, from, an example from Connecticut. Floating cages are better than the, you know, the intertidal ones because the oysters can feed 24 hours a day. They don't have to wait for the tide to come back. And on top of that, you don't have the farmer stomping down the bent, stomping on the benthos, and then you know basically you're going out there in a the boat, and then you just flip it over for it controls fouling, and it also helps to shape the oyster so that it's actually got a higher market uh, value. So in looking at the estuary, we can consider developing aquaculture. We can also enhance the natural the natural clam fishery, quahogs, other soft shells, uh, razor clams, and then you can also look at it in the context of critical areas to become protected habitats within them. So then that helps to produce uh, the, the, the fishery, of helps fishery production. Now looking at the, at this challenge, okay, basically Matt had said it's complicated, it's not that complicated really, but it is, you have to know the rules, okay? But anyway, there are limiting factors, or carrying capacity issues, the ecosystem, you wanna make sure that you don't deprive the ecosystem of, of nutrition, You've got uh, a production uh, aspects in terms of how much nutrients are available to grow on, physical constraints, how much area is there, and social. Social is a big deal because social, as we've heard around, is that hue are really threatened by this to an extent. So you really need to engage the community and actually get them involved in growing the shellfish. They can do, even if they have docks and things like this, especially the people on the shore, they can actually do what's called oyster gardening and do a little system right off their dock and grow their, their own oysters. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna go back. But anyway, but the other one is, the other factor is regulations. <coughs> regulations are, you, we've got all kinds. We've got the US Army Corps of Engineers involved. We've got the State the Department of Marine Fisheries, Division of Marine Fisheries involved. We've got the Conservation Commission in, in town involved, and the Department of Natural Resources. And they've got all their different rules and things about different factors that you have to consider in terms of how to do this. And working within all of that, you have to go like thread about 10 needles, but it's feasible. And it works to, to be able to do it. It's, it's doable because it is happening on the cave. Now, what can each oyster do? Each oyster can basically take up about 0.8 grams of nitrogen during its lifetime to a harvest size of about three inches. And that, uh, it takes about then about 1.25 million oysters to, uh, to consume a, a ton of nitrogen in the form of phytoplankton. So if we look at the ponds, we can see that uh, each pond can be basically tailored. And this is for 100%, just aquaculture. This is what the aquaculture would have to do in terms of taking on nitrogen. And you end up producing about, about uh, 2,800 tons of oysters. That's about 140 oysters for every person living on Cape Cod in the winter. But that's, oh, but it's only 1.1% of what's consumed in the United States and 15% of what's, what's uh, um, uh, produced. So it's a very, uh, th th there's actually a tremendous market for this, uh, especially fresh oysters. Most about 80 or 90 percent of the oysters that are consumed in the U.S. come from Asia, particularly China. If we look at this chart though, you look at Little Pond, 71 percent of the surface would need to be covered with oysters. It's too much. 
just to think about, 71, that's about half, actually, yeah, 71 percent would need to be used. So what can we do? We can open the inlets. That reduces the nitrogen load by 18%. You can cut this number in half. Then you can do maybe some barriers in some places and work with other interventions upstream and try to knock it down to a point where it's workable. But this is what would be required to get it to work uh, uh, just with, oil, with, with aquaculture. But it's not, it, it's, but so it, 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 there is a scope for it. So what do we get out of this? We get 28 tons of nitrogen removed. Uh, improved water quality, TMDL, or the sentinel threshold rather being uh, reached. You get to generate 280 oyster farmer jobs, $17 million in direct revenue, $75 million in the multiplier affecting the economy. You get 500 to 1,000 tons, or uh, rather uh, 800, 900 to, to over 1,000 tons of carbon dioxide sequestered in the shell. So we're pulling up CO2 out of the atmosphere, out of the water, and, and, and sequestering it. If you compare this like with a sewer system in Falmouth, the cost right now is about one ton of CO2 per year per house that's on the sewer system. It's, really, it's required to operate the system. That's the equivalent in terms of electricity that's used. So if you talk about 8,000 houses, you do the math in terms of the expansion, and then we've got a huge particular savings cost of a range of 0.5 to a billion dollars, because that $300 million is only for about 25, 20% of the town, or maybe about half of the area that, uh, that that's being that's under consideration right now. So there are two questions, though. This is from since we have folks here from EPA in particular or others. You know, can shellfish aquaculture inlet widening? If it results in achieving the sentinel threshold, is it still necessary to reach the TMDL? If we've done it, then is the TMDL suddenly a moot point? This is a question. Is it allowable? Do the regulations let you do that? Second question. In, using, in, in that context, EPA has a water quality training policy. If that's applied to this, then we also deal with the TMDL and, 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 and the issues. So these are two questions that, that, uh, that come from this. Now, in closing, I just like, you know, borrow from, uh, from a Paul Staff in, in Shakespeare's the, the, the Merry Wives of Windsor, where, where he says, uh, the world's mine oyster. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, thank you. What kind of education do we have on the cable? Let, while you're getting your, let me rem remind everyone, part of the method of who we're having here is that last spring, Falmouth voted 2.2 or 3, in that range, well, 27, but that included some continued. But for alternatives, 2.27. 2. 2. I'm sorry, and that did include the shellfish aquaculture demonstration, um, permeable barrier design, which we're going to hear about from you know, um, widening. Inlet widening was in there too. And composting toilets and urine diverting systems. So the public here has already voiced their strong uh, approval of exploring the uh, alternatives that you've heard, and we'll hear a little bit more from the next two speakers. Valerie, is it time for questions? Mm, yeah, sure. Well, you're getting well, you getting Well, that. What use for the oyster tissue? Because I'm a little concerned what you think here for human consumption, animal consumption, or what? Uh, OK, the question is, what do you do with the oysters? You know, after, <laughs> after, you, after you've grown them. Well, it's relative, compared to almost all other systems, it's relatively inexpensive. You can just reseed vineyard sounds, and they'd be, uh, you know, just put them back if you wanted to pay for it. If you wanted to make money with them, you can depurate them. And that is something where you just put them out and they, and, and they, they, they clean themselves up. There and this is the rules for that, and the national rules, the state rules are different, but, but those, are, those are factors. Maybe we can talk about that in the discussion period. <laughs>